Hi there, Marius here with the Resuscitation Coach. On this channel, we do all things resuscitation, so please consider subscribing. In today's video, we'll be discussing pediatric defibrillation, cardioversion, and pacing. So let's jump straight in. Here we go. Just a quick disclaimer, the resuscitation coach does not endorse any specific manufacturer and products shown is only for educational purposes. In medical emergencies, when patients suddenly deteriorate, the crash guard is one of the first items that we'll grab and bring to the patient's bedside. On the crash guard, we have our defibrillator, which is one of the most important pieces of life-saving equipment in our kit. So do not wait until you have an emergency to figure out how to use the defibrillator available to you. As professional healthcare providers, the defib and the crash cart should be some of the first pieces of equipment you familiarize yourself with. Multifunction pads are the most commonly used option to deliver an electrical shock to a patient in hospitals and emergency medical services, as they are quick to use, provide improved shock delivery if placed correctly, and improves the safety of the healthcare providers. Another benefit of using the multifunction pads is that they can be used without ECG leads. So where do we place the multifunction pads? Always follow the diagram on the pads. Typically, we use the anterior posterior or anterior apex position. Usually, it's easier to use the anterior apex position, but the anterior posterior position is preferred, especially in smaller children. With the anterior apex position, one pad is placed below the clavicle, while the other is placed on the left side of the chest below the pectoral muscle. With the anterior posterior placement, the one pad is positioned anteriorly, low chest in front of the heart, while the second pad is placed posteriorly behind the heart in between the scapula. Always use the diagrams on the pads and package as your reference. Other options available, but rarely use these days unless it's on movies and TV shows are the paddles. Some device manufacturers actually do not even supply paddles anymore, and this can be ordered as an additional accessory if required. Another option when patient's chest is open is to make use of the internal paddles that can be connected to your defibrillator. So what is defibrillation? Defibrillation is to deliver an electrical shock to the heart to completely depolarize the myocardium. And if there's enough high energy phosphates in the myocardium, hopefully the heart's automaticity kicks in and we have a normal perfusing rhythm. So when do we need to defibrillate our patients? Defibrillation is only required for lethal arrhythmias like ventricular fibrillation or VF and pulseless ventricular tachycardia. Remember team, for every minute we delay defibrillation, chances of success for our patient will diminish by 7 to 10% per minute. So we have to act quickly. The American Heart Association recommends the following dual settings for pediatrics. Your first shock will be delivered at 2 joules per kilogram, then the second will escalate to 4 joules per kilogram, and the third and subsequent shocks will be delivered at 4 joules per kilogram, as long as it does not exceed 10 joules per kilogram or the device-specific adult dose. Before you can defib, attach the pads as per the pads diagram. Our patient is weighing 25 kilogram. We're selecting 50 joules. 
we have pressed the charge button. We'll make sure no one is touching the patient and immediately deliver the shock and start with high quality chest compressions, pushing hard, pushing fast at the rate of 100 to 120 pushes per minute, remembering to allow full chest recoil, not interrupting CPR unnecessarily. And when giving breaths, we want to give just enough breaths to see visible chest rise. We have to push down one third of your anterior posterior chest. Other considerations that high performance teams should consider during defibrillation are the following. As part of minimizing hands off time and to improve your chest compression fraction or CCF, we will pre-charge the defibrillator 15 seconds before the end of each two minute cycle and also check for a pulse as placeholder and be prepared to deliver a shock in 10 seconds or less. At two minutes, the compressors will switch, hover, as to be ready to resume chest compressions immediately after defibrillation. So what is cardioversion or synchronized cardioversion? With cardioversion, we deliver a shock on top of the peak of the R wave, or actually a few milliseconds before the peak of the R wave, as we do not want to shock on the T wave, as it can convert the rhythm into ventricular fibrillation. Cardioversion is mostly used on unstable tachyarrhythmias where the patient has a pulse. The common pediatric rhythms for cardioversion is supraventricular tachycardi, or SVT and ventricular tachycardia with a pulse. Other rhythms, but less common in pediatrics, unless the child has a history of congenital heart disease, is AF or atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. Usually, if the patient is stable, has no serious signs or symptoms, and has a normal blood pressure, we'll be using medications. If the patient is unstable, then we will use synchronized cardioversion. Synchronized cardioversion can also be used on stable patients if the medication options did not convert the rhythm. Expert consultation is advised. The American Heart Association recommends the following dual settings for synchronized cardioversion. We'll start off at 0.5 joules per kilogram, which is half of the child's weight. Our second shock will be 1 joule per kilogram, which is the child's weight, and then 2 joules per kilogram, which is double the child's weight. Here as an example, we have a 50 kilogram child with an unstable ventricular tachycardia with a pulse. Also, don't forget to consider sedation if possible. Put the device into defib mode and activate sync. Select 25 joules, press charge and ensure everyone is clear and then push and hold the shock button until you hear that the shock has been delivered. Again, the device will not deliver the shock unless it's on top of the R wave. In this example, the rhythm did not convert and we increased the joule setting to 50 joules. Some devices, once you've delivered a synchronized shock, the sync mode will be deactivated and you will need to reactivate the sync mode. What is transcutaneous pacing or TCP? TCP is delivering a electrical energy to the heart to stimulate cardiac contraction through a set of electrodes or pads. TCP is not commonly used in pediatrics, but can be a life-saving intervention in selected cases of bradycardia caused by complete heart block or abnormal sinus node function for example, pacing is indicated for AV blocks, 
after surgical correction of congenital heart disease. TCP is only a temporary measure until a more permanent solution is available, like transvenous pacing or a permanent pacemaker if needed. When preparing for TCP, attach your pads in the anterior posterior position as it's typically the best position. Don't forget to attach your ECG leads. And then with TCP, the pads will only deliver the electrical impulses while the ECG electrodes will be showing you the ECG. Activate pacer mode. Select the rate. I'm selecting 80. And then you'll increase your output until you have capture. For capture, we should see a pacing spike immediately followed by a wide QRS. When capture is achieved, we will go to above this output level of where capture was achieved to create a buffer. Don't forget to recheck your vitals. If you benefited from this video, kindly like, subscribe and smash that notification bell. We'll see you in the next video. Have a fantastic day.